This is Carl Castle, School of Journalism Class of 1953, a Hall of Famer in 2004, welcoming you to the 2013 North Carolina Halls of Fame. Let's get started. Welcome to the uh, 2013 Halls of Fame. I'm Susan King. I'm the Dean of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication and thrilled to see such a powerful, full-packed room and I think you're in for quite an evening. Um, I think that uh, this room is full of talent and I'm only a proxy for the school, uh, for the kind of talent that has nurtured the students of today and uh, brought us to a place like this today. And so I would like all the faculty and staff of the uh, School of Journalism and Mass Communication communication, please stand because they are the real reason that we are here today. They are the difference. They are the secret sauce here at UNC. And you're going to be meeting a few of them a little bit later and you'll hear why. We're going to start tonight with a pause and a prayer. You know, journalism isn't an easy business in any day, but it is a profession and a mission and a career that really makes a difference in the world. Chris Hondros died two years ago this weekend, documenting a country that was struggling for its soul. Chris's family honors us tonight by allowing us to honor him. 
Chris is not with us tonight, but this video will bring his work and his dedication alive for all of us. So we just take a minute, meet Chris Andros in his own words. I am a, a traveling journalist, you know, I do a lot of conflict zones. And Iraq is a particularly extreme one, but the conflict zones around the world do have a lot of similarities to each other. And part of yours, when, when people talk about being an experienced war correspondent, part of that experience means like keeping yourself sane in these places, in these insane places. Um, so for my part, you know, what's fun in Iraq? Well, you know, we have the journalists all stay in this hotel that's, that's barricaded, as I was mentioning earlier, a little mini green zone outside of the green zone. And um, we have parties, you know, people get together. My company is luckily, we, we have the penthouse suite on the top floor of the hotel we, that we snagged as soon as it became available, that we've had for four years and we'll never leave up, never leave. And um, so we have one of the biggest spaces. And so we have people up at least once a week for cheap wine that we, when we can find it and, mm -hmm. and parties and talking about the situation. And, and uh, it's really not dissimilar from a party you might find in Pittsburgh or in New York or something, you know. I believe in the work that I do in Iraq. I believe in the work that journalists in general do. Journalists have a basic function to oversee the acts of government and the Iraq invasion is an act of government to the nth degree. It, it must be overseen on some level. But if I can keep myself from bringing too much of that home and, keep, and continue to have home and a life here, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. Chris's mom is with us tonight. Inga Hondras moved from New York City to North Carolina to raise Chris here. He loved this state, and his fiance is with us tonight to talk about him and accept his award. Christiana Paella is a, come on up. Uh, she's a former AP photojournalist and editor. She's a current public interest lawyer. And when you realize, we knew that he'd want us to be here having a drink in his honor tonight because that's what he did when he was with his friends. Christina. Thank you. I'd like to extend a warm note of thanks to Dean King, the UNC community, the other honorees this evening, and all those that have gathered here today, especially Chris's family and colleagues who have traveled from afar to celebrate this honor with us. As we just saw, Chris always told great stories, whether through his expressive narratives or within his powerful photographs. Through his images, we witness a Liberian rebel fighter exalt during a firefight, the haunting cry of an Iraqi girl struck by the grief of her parents' death during a horrible combat zone mistake 
a U.S. soldier riding confidently in a Humvee during the first few days of, an Iraq, of the Iraq War and the striking eyes of an Afghani village boy. And it is from those stories embedded in Chris's telling imagery that we recognize his vision and distinct ability to bring shared human experiences from far off places into our hearts and minds. Chris's absence in our world is immeasurable. We are humbled and honored to receive this award on behalf of the extraordinary life he led and continue to honor his life and legacy with the creation of the Chris Hondros Fund. This fund supports emerging journalists and his colleagues while raising awareness of so many of those that are still reporting from conflict zones. And we thank you again for this tremendous honor. Thank you. And one of our grads is, has the honor of being that Chris Hondros Photojournalist Fellowship. And she's out doing the work and his legacy and taking great pictures. Um, tonight, we want, to be, we want you to be with your family and with your friends and with your colleagues in his honor. We're going to have salad served now, and then we'll be back. But take that moment to recognize the person next to you, because we're so lucky to be all together. See you in a few. Marshall McLuhan seems the right kind of scholar to quote as we start this phase of it. He said that advertising is the greatest art form of the 20th century. And as you're going to see from our two Hall of Famers in advertising, it has led to two very different paths and equally great success. In two, 2013, however, if you say advertising to our students, they say madmen. So we decided we'd turn to our very own madman, John Sweeney, head of the advertising area. He's going to give our first and our second award. Come on up, John. <laughs> I knew Stacy Wall as a truly an original thinker and writer who showed amazing potential and promise. So I was thrilled when he was hired by agency BBDO, BBDO New York right out of school. Now you never know what's going to happen when a student leaves our beautiful campus and hits the corridors of a major advertising agency. But what Stacy did with the opportunity remains amazing. In a place where as many as 20 creative teams compete on major assignments, Stacy had 11 major television commercials produced his first year. But Stacy is known by an ability to make unexpected changes. He decided to move to a small boutique agency, Deutsch, so he could write even more provocative work. The radical shift made him the perfect candidate when Wyden and Kennedy was looking for a writer on one of the most creative accounts in the country, Nike. The writer on Nike, pretty good. But he was only beginning. Stacy made his way through the ranks to creative director by writing and producing some of the most memorable advertising anywhere. Commercials for Nike and ESPN Sports Center so famous they were part of the culture. Which prompted another change. To decide to take a break from advertising and start developing ideas for television program. A short-lived experiment that awakened an interest in the art of production. So he started his own firm as a commercial director. And so far he's assembled as a director a not so bad list of clients. Microsoft, Lexus, Nike, Heineken, Land Rover, Lipton, Intel, Comcast, and Dr. Pepper to name a few. <laughs> so great has been his success as a director that when the Directors Guild of America gave awards in 2010, Tom Hooper won for the movie The King's Speech, Martin Scorsese won for HBO's Boardwalk Empire, and Stacy won the award as the top commercial director in America. What a journey. I am honored and delighted to introduce as a member of the North Carolina Advertising Hall of Fame, Stacy Wall. Uh, 
Uh, that was so nice, John. Thank you so much. I uh, would not be here without John Sweeney. Um, as you can tell from my choice of footwear, for those that noticed, uh, Show your feet. I was not one destined for any Hall of Fame. Um, when I was a freshman at Chapel Hill, if people wondered what Hall of Fame I might get into someday, maybe Bojangles Chicken and Biscuits Consumption Hall of Fame. <laughs> and that would be about it. Um, but I sincerely uh, appreciate what John did for me. Um, I was desperate to find a major that didn't involve math, and uh, I found one. And uh, then I found, through John's classes and some other classes at UNC School of Journalism in the advertising program, that, wow, this is, um, this is a job that maybe I could do. It, it sort of awakened me the idea of how creativity and business could merge. You know, I, I wasn't the most creative of my friends, and I certainly wasn't the most business-like of my friends, but I was sort of right in the middle. And so I found the sweet spot which brought me here today. Um, so again, John, I just want to thank you and I want to thank the UNC School of Journalism and Dean King for hosting this event. It's quite an honor to be um, amongst all of the nominees and all of you tonight. And um, I really don't know, um, I, I, for certain, I, I'm certain I would not be here uh, without UNC and without John. Um, and also my friend Lane Worcester, who I lived with in college, um, he and I, you know, once I got into the advertising program, we would um, collaborate and work on things that, again, were just, wow, this could be a real job. So as, 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 uh, as surreal as it is to be here, um, I'm honored to um, be a part of this tonight. And uh, thanks to all of you. I appreciate it. Thank you. When I was traveling around before I became the dean um, and I would meet alums, so many of them would mention professors who made a difference in their life. And that is what I think is so remarkable at the school. And John Sweeney was one of those that I kept hearing about. And so that I think proof of that, proof of what makes the school great is that our second awardee, who, by the way, I just Stacy, he did know about numbers. He, he did a joint degree with the Keenan Flagler School and School of Journalism. But he, too, asked John Sweeney to give him his award tonight. So you're back on, Madman. Right. <laughs> you know, it's pretty easy to envision the future. I do it all the time. A misty, dreamy vision that stays locked in my head. It's quite something else to envision the future, shape it, build it, bring it to the marketplace, and be proven right. Now that's talent, and that describes Jason Kyler. I knew Jason as one of my top students in an advanced class on advertising creative. A double major in business, <clears throat> I knew him as a witty writer and a fabulous artist. He created an innovative cartoon resumes about himself and caught the attention of his dream company, Walt Disney. After a few years, this incredibly creative kid decided he needed the knowledge and credentials of an up-and-coming school that is the citadel of numbers and quantification, Harvard Business. He envisioned it, he was accepted, he pulled it off. Right brain, left brain, boom. Amazing. <laughs> now with such a dream background, you of course go to the bluest of blue chip companies where success is assured. Jason decided to go to a young startup, and yes, it was a startup then, named after a river of all things. Jason traded Harvard for Amazon.com, where he worked his way to senior vice president of worldwide application software for the now famous digital icon. And then, in my opinion, his greatest adventure. He dropped out for a year and traveled with wife Jamie and their kids around the world. Perhaps 19 different countries, 56 cities, with toddlers. <laughs> That's courage. When he returned, he was hired by a consortium of established TV networks to harness the new digital world. He told me about coming to the office the first day and seeing the place jammed with high-priced consultants. He had a headache by two and an empty office a day or so later. He and a tiny team put together from around the world would work together to create Hulu, the extraordinary digital network that shook up the entire concept of watching television. Jason, the charismatic CEO, became one of the most celebrated leaders in business. But Jason sees something different in the future. So he negotiated a friendly departure from Hulu and is going to start a brand new firm that captures a new future. 
And make no mistake, he will shape it, he will build it, he will bring it to the marketplace, and I have no doubt he'll be proven right again. I am honored and delighted to introduce as a member of the North Carolina Advertising Hall of Fame, Jason Kyler. So one thing which is, I was mentioning to Stacy, I just met Stacy Wall for the first time about 45 minutes ago, and I told him he was this godlike creature that I uh, had always heard about from John Sweeney when I was an undergrad, because so Stacy was a couple of years ahead of me. So, uh, so, I've <laughs> so I got some different shoes too. So, uh, um, so uh, it is just so uh, humbling and unexpected to be included in this group from Stacy and Alan and Don and the rest of the crew that's being inducted today. Um, I can't thank you enough. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dean King. It is uh, absolutely humbling uh, and unexpected, and I, um, I'm, I'm sincerely thankful. I, uh, I've always been so fortunate in my career in that uh, most people uh, work, and they, they consider it work, and I've been so lucky and fortunate in my life to never uh, have what I consider to work. Uh, it was always, it's always been a mission, and it's, uh, it's, it's been hard, but it's always been a mission. And I attribute that to three things. Uh, one is my mom and dad, uh, first and foremost, for, for unconditionally loving me. I, that always gave me so much confidence and ability to pursue things that I loved as opposed to the things that society often expected of one person. Uh, the second thing is they were foolish enough to believe in me and imparted that belief that you can do anything you put your mind to uh, and work ethic to. And then the third thing was UNC uh, and John Sweeney specifically. Um, as John mentioned, I went uh, to, to two schools here, the business school and the journalism school, and I studied advertising uh, under John Sweeney. And the combination of those two schools really made me who I was. And, uh, and there was a lot of pressure, I remember, at that, that point in your life where, you know, most people go and do very traditional careers. And, uh, and John Sweeney was the one person who I got to uh, interact with who actually celebrated and supported these wacky and crazy thoughts that I had to, to draw comic strips of myself as a resume as opposed to going down the traditional path. And, uh, and I am so thankful for that because had that not happened, uh, um, maybe I'd be inducted into an investment banker hall of fame or something. Uh, so, uh, um, so I'm so thankful to be able to uh, be an innovator. And, uh, and John had such a huge influence on me and I'm so thankful for him. I'm thankful for my aunt and uncle and for my mother-in-law and for my brother-in-law. Um, and uh, 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 and everyone here, thank you very, very much, and I so, so very much appreciate it. Now we go to the Public Relations Hall of Fame, Don Baer. We have one person um, who is going to be inducted this year, and I think he is a man who personifies so well the role of communication in America's public life in democracy. It's about politics, it's about policy, and it's about that public square. To make this award tonight our own chancellor, he is the man who convinced me to come to this great school, not just because he, I knew it was a great J school, but because he really enticed me. He saw education as the locus of innovation and a place where big problems can be tackled and solved. I was hooked. A warm welcome to Chancellor Holden Thorpe, our leader and my boss. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, it's great to be here tonight. It's very ironic that I'm introducing someone for an award in public relations. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think Don's firm is the only crisis communications firm that I haven't hired. <laughs> and Jason, I'm glad you came to Carolina, but if you'd come to Washington University, we definitely could have made you into an investment banker. <laughs> okay, so. And, you know, despite my checkered record in journalism, I did bring Susan King to the University of North Carolina.
Okay, now some of you may know our next honoree because of his current job as worldwide chair and CEO of Burson Marsteller. Or you may know him as a media lawyer, as a journalist for the U.S. News and World Report, or as a member of the prestigious Order of the Golden Fleece at Carolina. Or you may know him as an Emmy award-winning documentary producer and strategist at Discovery Communications. Or you may know him as a key member of the White House communications team that served President Clinton through the 1996 election. I know Don Bear as Helga Bear's son. <laughs> That's how everyone in Fayetteville knows Don Bear. <laughs> Some people would look at a career like Don's and see a fellow who couldn't hold a job in the same profession for more than a few years. And he doesn't even have a journalism degree. But his degrees are in political science, international relations, and in law. And that is an embodiment of the way we think about things at the University of North Carolina, that someone with a broad education like that could do so many interesting and specific things that, that Don has done. And it is a lesson for all the journalism and communications uh, students out there. This is a person who used the skills he learned in college and followed his passion. And the result is a stellar career centered around a common theme, how to use words and images to bring ideas to the world. No matter what task Don has set himself to, whether it be working to free a wrongly accused man from death row, covering the world as a journalist, writing State of the Union speeches, creating a documentary film festival, or developing new ways to educate people on timely public policy issues, he has brought the same values that we both learned from our dads way back in Fayetteville. Be honest, be fair, be transparent, and always stay true to your passion. Ladies and gentlemen, Don Baer. I just gave Holden my, my card, yeah. and I want, six weeks I, want, I want the record to reflect, I tried to get him to hire our firm. <laughs> Holden, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. It's very special for me to be introduced by the Chancellor. Uh, I'm from Fayetteville. I want to talk a little bit more about that. But the true great success story from my hometown is Chancellor Holden Thorpe, and it makes me very proud <laughs> to be here with you. So this kind of wacky career of mine that he described, I think it's testament to the fact that you can get along even if you never do decide what you want to be when you grow up. <laughs> uh, th this is a homecoming for me, certainly geographically, but also spiritually. Uh, I've, ha I've been very fortunate in my life to have many good things happen to me, and so much of the good is rooted here and rooted really in the people here and the influences that they've had on my life. Uh, Holden and I come from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, that's as much a spirit and a community as it is a geographical place. He mentioned our fathers, they were lawyers together in Fayetteville, uh, and he's exactly right. The values and the principles that we learned, hard work, of dedication to principle, of a sense of community, belonging to something bigger and more important than yourself, these are all important things. Now, Holden and I share something else, which is that we both went to Terry Sanford High School. Uh, Terry Sanford, who, of course, was our great governor of North Carolina and the uh, president of uh, another university uh, nearby. <laughs> but we share that also with uh, tonight's uh, another honoree from Fayetteville, the other honoree from Fayetteville, Chris Hundros. And I want to say that it is humbling uh, to be among, among those who are honored tonight, along with Chris. Uh, I learned tonight that Chris and I got our start in journalism at the Fayetteville Observer, and there are representatives from the Observer here tonight. Uh, I think Chris uh, learned a lot more during his time at the Observer than I seem to have learned, uh, but it, it is indeed a special thing to be a part of this evening, and I want to thank his family and friends for being here tonight as well. Um, Susan King, who is a great old friend, uh, and someone that I've known for many years, 
and it gave my heart great lift when she agreed to come here to Chapel Hill to take on this terrific job. I, I know that you are all very thrilled and excited by the work that she's been doing. She is someone who is immensely respected and admired and liked by many, many great people in journalism and across the media, and she's a great, great asset. And Susan, it's just wonderful to see you here. Uh, so I want to say a few more things about Fayetteville. Uh, there's a theme here. Uh, there are people here tonight who uh, really have sort of made it possible for me to have all those great opportunities. Joel Fleischman is here. Uh, who is the mentor of my life, uh, and without whom um, most of the things that have happened to me and the kinds of opportunities I've had would never have taken place. Uh, we're going to move over the fact that Joel uh, is associated with that other place, but uh, <laughs> let the record also reflect Joel lives here in Chapel Hill and always has. Uh, uh, my best friend from first grade, Toby McCoy, is here. And that tells you something about the sort of people and place that I do come from, that we are still dear friends all these years later. My wife, Nancy Bard, who is the light of my life, uh, along with our boys, uh, Nick and Adam. Nick is in Cape Town, South Africa today. Uh, uh, Adam is in Hanover, New Hampshire. We won't talk about that either. Uh, uh, it, the people that I owe the most, most to for all of this, of course, are my parents. Uh, and you heard about my mother who was here tonight uh, and my father who would have loved to have been here. Uh, the thing that they gave to me that I, one of the most important things in my life they gave me was UNC, was this place in Chapel Hill and everything that it embodies. Uh, my mother used to say that she married my father so that her children could go to Chapel Hill. <laughs> I suspect there was more to it than that, but maybe not, I don't know, but it worked out. But what they gave me, and my father taught me from a very early age, what a special place this was, how it represented truth and progress in this state and in the world, and that was something that to me was a very important part of who I was as a young person and who I have been my whole life. Uh, Lux et libertas, light and liberty, uh, were really the things that this institution and everything that it meant embodied in this state, and I hope that that continues to always be the case. Now there's another motto uh, about North Carolina that really speaks to the spirit of what I think this uh, award and these uh, inductions are about, and that's the motto of the state of North Carolina, esse quam videri, which means to be rather than to seem. To me, that's really what this is about. That's what the world of communications and media and journalism and advertising and public relations should all be about, that we have to really be about that which we really are not those things that seem to be. And so I'm very proud to share all of that with you about this place and to call that spirit home. So thank you very much. Um, as many of you know, the Journalism Hall of Fame is the oldest of the three. It was begun in 1981, and it is a much coveted award. And tonight, we're going to induct a group that proves, I think, both of the diversity and the power of what it means to be a journalist. For our first up, will Cheryl Carpenter join us for the first of our journalism presentations? Cheryl, where are you? There you are. I'm pleased to say that Cheryl is one of our success stories. There is a theme here. She's an alum of the school, and she's managing editor of the Charlotte Observer with a string of editing successes, a Neiman Fellowship in her portfolio, and a convention coverage last summer that went off like that. It was perfect, and it was all on your back. So Cheryl, come do the honors. Thank you. And good evening. I'm here to, to talk about Doug Smith, who was a mentor to me. Um, of all the columns that Doug wrote for The Observer in his 20-year career as a business columnist, there was only one line and one story, Doug, that made me go, really? Um, he wrote that he was going, getting a paycheck for something he would do for free. Still mulling that one, Doug. I'm, I'm, I see you've raised four kids on a journalist out. <laughs> well, for, his four children were raised on a journalist salary. That's Jody, Holly, Robbie, and Carrie. 
In his career, Doug was both a writer and an editor at the, at the, in Raleigh, in Wichita, and in Charlotte. He covered everything from drug bust, to wheat harvest, to garbage strikes. His fame, in my opinion, however, is tied to his role as a business columnist at the Charlotte Observer. In his 20-some years in that job, he had the best seat in the house for reporting the extraordinary era of growth that Charlotte experienced. He wrote about skyscrapers and galloping suburbs and the transformation overnight of the Charlotte City Center. He grew up in Charlotte, and that gave him an historic understanding of the implications of all the development around us. Readers could see that he cared about our city. He could tell you how a road widening project was going to change neighborhood, and he could tell you how a shopping center was going to give rise to one. He earned a commercial real estate license while he was a journalist, so he could better understand all the rules that he was going to encounter when reporting this story. He built incredible sources for us, and that was tough because the developers and the influential in Charlotte weren't necessarily willing to share their scoops so easily. I think Doug's calm demeanor and easy smile helped that. Doug wanted to know why red dirt was moving in Charlotte. If he saw a lot being cleared or a surveyor paused at an intersection, he would turn his car around and he would, wanted to talk to the guys on the lot and the guys who owned the lot. His column, The Next Big Thing, was one of the Observer's best brands ever. I wish I had a new subscription for every time I heard someone say, I read Doug Smith's column first every day. He was a pro with endurance and reinvention. Remember, Doug went from typewriters to blogging tools. But we all knew that his first devotion is to his family, children and grandchildren, and to his wife, Linda. He occasionally wrote about home life and memories of his mother and father rearing him in the old Wilmore neighborhood of Charlotte that endeared him all the more to our readers and occasionally making his children blush. His column about his potbelly pig hubba is still one of the faves in the Observer's Library. Doug, thank you again for all those long days and for all the calls that we made to you and Linda at home late at night. And thanks for all the advice you gave me personally. Your values live on in our newsroom, and that's a very good thing. Congratulations. Well, you know something? I really wanted to be an astronaut or a test pilot. <laughs> After I enrolled in ROTC, Air Force ROTC at Carolina, <clears throat> I managed to get sick in three different types of aircraft. <laughs> Helicopter, cargo plane, and a jet trainer. On top of that, I found out I had faulty eyesight and an irregular heartbeat. <laughs> so, goodbye Air Force, hello journalism. <laughs> Not quite as restrictive on qualifications, I don't think. But I knew <clears throat> when I landed my first job in 1965 at the Raleigh Times that I, I'd found the right career. Uh, I started out as a part-time reporter at $2 a week. And I needed the money, but I probably would have given it up, as, as Cheryl said, because it was such a great experience meeting people and writing stories. And also, as a senior at Chapel Hill, you could, you could walk over to the campus at one of the girls' schools in Raleigh and say, hey, you want to meet Sonny and Cher? I'm interviewing them tonight. And so that career worked for me. Uh, two years later, I reconnected with my hometown and got back to Charlotte. I wanted to be a part of the action, gain the trust of readers, and touch the lives of people through the newspaper. I know it's ambitious and optimistic, but that's, that's what I really wanted to do. I always wanted to go back to my hometown. I never really cared much about leaving it. Uh, <clears throat> to me, it never got old. Chasing the big story gave me the same adrenaline rush in the last year as it did in the first year. Uh, I'm just grateful that the Observer kept me around and supported my habit for four decades. And I'm delightfully surprised and appreciative of the Hall of Fame for recognizing me. 
<clears throat> but I have to say, this is not something you do by yourself. My wife, Linda, my children, my friends, and my co-workers have always had my back, and I'm grateful to them for doing that. Thank you. Our next honoree is uh, Wyndham Robertson. And uh, when I was in New York City before I came here, I w you know, had an awful lot of women friends. They'd say, oh, you've got to meet Wyndham Robertson. I mean, I think she knows everyone in New York, everywhere I went. And she knows everyone in North Carolina and certainly Chapel Hill. Um, Ford Worthy, will you come up to do the honors? Ford, let me tell you a little bit about him. Lawyer and an innovator who gave up journalism for the heights of business and entrepreneurism. He was a writer and an associate editor at Fortune magazine and headed the Hong Kong Bureau. Most important, perhaps, for tonight, Ford is Wyndham's neighbor. <laughs> Thank you. I'm another mentee introducing a mentor, and it's a thrill to do that. I first came face to face with Wyndham in 1969, and I remember it vividly. I was bounding through down the stairs at my neighbor's house, her sister's house, and I literally crashed into this huge framed newspaper ad. I think it was the back page of the New York Times with this, with this photograph of this dashing, glamorous young woman uh, with the cut line that I'll never forget, she wrestles bulls, bears, and arbitrageurs. <laughs> that magnetic young woman was, of course, Wyndham. And the ad, it was part of a campaign by Fortune magazine to show off one of its brightest stars, a woman, a woman in 1969, who by that time had established herself in the clubby, almost entirely male world of, of Wall Street as a writer with just an uncommon talent for explaining the most complicated of topics. And as for me, I was a 13-year-old boy, and I was smitten for life, Wyndham. <laughs> Wyndham's career in journalism began in 1961, which adds up to 52 years ago for most of us, for most of us, but not for Wyndham. For if you have the sort of youthful, curious, engaged sort of mindset that personifies her, 1961 was practically yesterday. When she arrived at Fortune, she was just a few years out of Holland's University where she had earned a degree in economics. And just a footnote there, she later served Holland's for 31 years as a trustee where the Wyndham Robertson Library is today a campus landmark. At Fortune, her first job was as a researcher reporter. That was a position that was not only the bottom of the ladder for even the most brilliant young women, but it was the top rung too at that time. Uh, jobs like writing and editing, they were reserved exclusively for men. And after all, as the tagline from that ad that I mentioned put it, Fortune was, quote, for the men in charge of change. <laughs> and as the times changed, Wyndham kept adding rungs to the ladder. She began writing Fortune's Hallmark Personal Investing column in 1967. She then branched out into doing longer, often very definitive pieces including groundbreaking pieces, uh, articles on the paucity of women at the very top ranks of, of corporate America. In 1972, she received the prestigious Loeb Achievement Award. And after Wyndham had written about something, for example, her profile of a Texas real estate tycoon named Trammell Crow, who I think later named a hotel chain after her, the Wyndham. <laughs> There was, there was just nothing new to write about uh, a subject that she had covered for a very, very long time. In the mid-1970s, she moved into the core of editors at Fortune, and in 1981, she became the magazine's first female assistant managing editor. Carol Loomis, a legendary Fortune uh, editor who I had the privilege of working with as well as with Wyndham, and who's still going strong in her 80s, paints this scene of the magazine's senior editors sitting around a fancy New York conference ta table, and the discussion turns to a book that was apparently then the rage. Erud erudite conversation, spirited extolling of the book. And then Wyndham weighs in with her charming, very distinctive Southern accent. You sort of have to, had to be there to, to get it. And she said, I just don't get this book at all. <laughs> 
Wyndham taught us to never pretend, to never fake it, to keep asking the, quote, dumb questions until you really, truly got it. And it was impossible to work with her, and it was also impossible to be an effective journalist without taking that lesson to heart. She left Fortune in 1986 when President Spangler lured her here to become the first female vice president for communications at, UNC, at the UNC system. She spent 10 years there, including a responsibility for UNC TV. Her involvement in the broader media and financial world then expanded further to include board seats at uh, such major public companies as Cap Cities, ABC, Wachovia Bank, and others. And the good news is that the story of her career in journalism is not over. Just last year, in fact, when Warren Buffett became a major shareholder in a company called Media General, which is an old line newspaper and TV station conglomerate that is now trying to transform itself into a modern digital media and mobile platform company, whom did he name to the board? Well, it's my honor to introduce her, my friend and mentor, Wendem Robertson. Thank you, Ford. That was a lot better than I am. Uh, and thank you. Um, my uh, friends and family, so many of you, for being here tonight. I'd like to single out my sister Blanche. Blanche, please wave. <laughs> because without her influence, I would have grown up to be a pathetic recluse <laughs> and certainly would not be standing here. She has brought an entourage that includes her wonderful husband, a sensational daughter-in-law, and four incomparable direct descendants, including one named Wyndham. Raise your hand. <laughs> I became a journalist because of Ida Gordoner, an old maid who taught journalism in my public high school in Salisbury. She also taught Latin, which dates me, and was advisor to the Yellow Jacket, the school's bi-weekly newspaper for which I was co-editor-in-chief. Salisbury had a lot of great journalists, at least three of him, whom are in your Journalism Hall of Fame, Jimmy Hurley, Rose Post, and Bill Snyder. I knew and admired them all and am honored to be in their company. I'm happy, too, to be the second Hollins graduate inducted, the first being the pioneering female sports writer, Mary Garber. My luckiest break was to be hired at Fortune when I was 24 by the woman Ford mentioned, Carol Loomis, who became a legendary financial journalist. She was my mentor, is still a close friend, and at age 83, is now in her 60th year on the staff of Fortune, doing prize-winning work. I also had a lot of help from male colleagues at Fortune, especially the late Dan Seligman, also a mentor, who promoted me to writer, and to a former managing editor, Bill Rukeyser, who elevated me to assistant managing editor, the slot on the masthead that no woman had ever occupied, but which th since then, I'm happy to say, lots of other women have. One of my other great promoters was Chuck Whittingham, who is here tonight. Chuck was, <laughs> <laughs> Chuck was associate publisher of Fortune in the golden years and had an expense account that King Tut would have killed for. <laughs> Even though church, Chuck was state and I was church with a little match girl expense account, we sometimes collaborated to advance various fortune interests. I was never sure if we were working or just having fun, a feeling I often had at Time Inc. And that's why it was such an awesome place to work back in the day. And thank you Dick Spangler and Meredith for being here tonight. 
Soon after Dick became president of the University of North Carolina, he invited me to Chapel Hill, and in April of 1986, took me to this very Hall of Fame dinner. Shortly thereafter, he hired me as UNC's Vice President for Communication. Working with Dick at our splendid university greatly enriched my life, as has my friendship with him and Meredith. And finally, a big cheer to Susan King, who brings incredible experience, intelligence, and firepower to the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Let's face it, Susan has a lot of influence over who gets inducted. And bottom line, as they say, I owe this recognition, this humbling, thrilling recognition, mainly to her. <laughs>Cartooning, a great journalism tradition. To do the honors for Dwayne Powell, we have Tom Smith. He, come on up, Tom. He's published magazines, the Triangle Business Journal. He's run publishing houses. And now he's raising horses and hay in Silk Hope, North Carolina. And he claims to be a guitar-picking buddy of Dwayne's. So you've got the truth. Here you are. Well, how to introduce Dwayne Powell. I was told I only had two minutes, and that's really not long enough to skewer Dwayne. See, skewer is Dwayne's favorite phrase for the targets of his cartoons. Now, I need to say a quick thank you to the News and Observer. Thank you for bringing him out of retirement, at least on Sundays, because there's, um, well. <laughs> because there's certainly no uh, shortage of material right now, is there? Um, but I won't skew her Dwayne tonight. I won't, I won't do that. Um, I will tell you that he has some, some uh, really unique talents. Obviously, one of those is to be able to just nail a politician or a public official uh, when they truly deserve it. But Dwayne has this way of doing it to be able to, seems to be able to make them like it. Um, I know you all remember um, Jesse Helms with the beady eyes and the huge glasses and Jim Hunt with the pompadour with the comb sticking out of it. <laughs> And then these people would call Dwayne and ask him if they could have a copy to hang on their wall. <laughs> so many things about Dwayne I, I just don't understand. But um, maybe it is a good thing that I only have two minutes, because that's about the limit of Dwayne's attention span. Um, <laughs> but despite that, despite that, um, Dwayne has accomplished quite a lot for a country boy from McGee, Arkansas. Um, Dwayne, for one thing, has managed to turn a proper name into a verb. To Dwayne. Um, Steve Riley, in an excellent article on Friday, defined it as to move happily and unconcerned through life, guided by others. <laughs> in that same article, Steve described Dwayne as being like a lab puppy, let loose in a fresh meadow, uncertain of what spots to mark first. <laughs> Both of those are pretty much right on, on target. Another version of that is to, is to be Dwayne. And if, when you are Dwayne, that means that you have been lulled into the false belief that Dwayne will actually show up when and where he said that he would. <laughs> I once invited Dwayne to some event or the other, and he said, sure, I'll be there. And his, uh, his wife, the long-suffering Jam Powell, <laughs> was... Jan was, Jan was standing nearby and she said, Dwayne, you will be in Arizona that day. To which Dwayne replied, well, I'll do both. <laughs> that's, a, that's a true story. Um, uh, Jan describes running Dwayne's um, calendar as uh, being like trying to nail jello to a tree, <laughs> which is also a pretty, pretty apt description. We told Dwayne that this was a Friday luncheon. <laughs> so we think he's going to be here soon. <laughs> but you get the idea. But seriously, um, I've been Dwayne's friend and his music partner, and I've been enjoying his cartoons for 35 years. And in his own unique way, he can make you laugh, he can make you cry, he can make you smile, he can make you angry. Um, but you make a boneheaded statement, uh, you abuse the public trust, 
You get caught with your hand in the till, and Duane, with wit and humor and good old country common sense, will shine a very bright light on you. He's done over 8,000 cartoons for the News and Observer uh, and, since 1975, and hundreds more uh, before that in Hot Springs, San Antonio, and Cincinnati. So I'm proud to introduce to you Dwayne Powell. <laughs> Uh, we really wanted to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, didn't we? <laughs> Thanks, old buddy. I'm grateful they only gave us two minutes. <laughs> My thanks to all who were involved with this nomination and friends who traveled all the way from Arkansas. Raise your hands over there. But don't call the hogs. <laughs> no. <laughs> and all the other great friends and colleagues who are here tonight. Thanks to Claude Sitton and Tom Inman, who drove all the way up here from South Carolina, who hired me in 1975. Farrell Guillory and the long-suffering Steve Ford, I don't know, I'm, who was also the captain of the Spelling and Hyphen Police. <laughs> and Orange Quarles, the publisher of the News and Observer. My path into journalism probably began with a mousy little guidance counselor who forced me as a failing 11th grader to join the annual staff and illustrate the divider pages. I'll never forget the rush I felt when the books came out and I saw my drawings in print for the first time. I was hooked. Coming from a farm environment, I didn't pursue art training and majored in agribusiness. While in college, I was asked by a local editor to draw editorial cartoons for his paper. My small town innocence was soon pierced by the crucible of the issues boiling up in the 60s. One issue in particular forced me to decide if I was illustrating the news with funny pictures or truly had something to say. Overnight, it seemed the Jim Crow laws that had defined my world were being challenged. I'd grown up playing with the sharecroppers' children who worked and lived on our farm, only to see them get on a different bus before we started school. I made my decision that bucking the status quo was to join with the better angels. This has guided my thinking ever since. Soon after I came to the NO, I can say this because Frank doesn't own the paper anymore. <laughs> Soon after I came to the NO, publisher Frank Daniels, who has a unique way of cutting to the chase, stuck his head in my door one day and said, Dwayne, it was, I was at a party last night, and three people came up to me and said, I should fire you. <laughs> Three others came up and said, I should give you a raise. You must be doing something right. And I got to do it for 35 years. I can't close without thanking the person who has kept me anchored all these years, and probably the only person who offered up witty ideas now and then that I could actually use. My lovely wife, Jan, of 42 years. <laughs> Okay, she gave me all the ideas, what can I say? And I married her when she was 15. <laughs> thank you, Jan, and thank you all very much for being here tonight. <clears throat>
In 2000, Jane received a $3 million federal grant to study that subject. And I think at that time, that was the biggest grant that any faculty member in the journalism school had brought in. With that money, she proved what she had long suspected, that adolescents' exposure to sexual content in the mass media leads to earlier and more advanced sexual behavior. One article from that groundbreaking study has been cited 275 times by scholars all over the country who have followed Jane into what was then a new research area. In addition to that article, Jane has four books, 28 book chapters, and another 49 peer-reviewed articles to her credit, and maybe a couple more in the works. Jane's thought leadership in the field of media effects in adolescent health enhanced the school's reputation as a research powerhouse. Before long, students were moving to Chapel Hill to study with Jane. When I was on the graduate admissions committee, aspiring scholars wrote in their grad school applications, I want to be Jane Brown when I grow up. <laughs> My colleagues are now nodding because that's a true story. I want to be Jane Brown. <laughs> then, because Jane can't resist an opportunity to do good work, Jane created an interdisciplinary health communication program at Carolina. Today, 25 faculty members across the UNC campus research health communication, and 20 graduate students have earned health communication certificates. Furthermore, and perhaps more important, Jane is the nicest woman in North America. <laughs> Jane has met, <laughs> thank you. Jane has mentored more than 50 graduate students and numerous junior faculty. I personally have been promoted twice because of advice she gave me over breakfast at the waffle shop on Franklin Street. <laughs> if you need help, just go there. She also remained friends with me when she was mad about pornography and its impact on kids, and I was always defending the First Amendment rights of pornographers. <laughs> I've known Jane for 25 years. I saw her change the public and academic conversation about the media and children and inspire a new generation of scholars to do research with impact just like Jane did. I also saw her nurture everyone around her to live happier lives. On behalf of all your colleagues and students, thank you, Jane. Thank you so much. This is such an honor. Um, I say that I, I uh, was lucky enough to be born in the 60s, so I actually did engage in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> and then I had the good fortune of being able to study it for the rest of my career. It's been fabulous. And, um, and what I... I I'm also the product of, I am also was lucky enough to have been born at the first, in the middle of the second women's movement. And, and I was lucky enough also to have parents who believed that women could do anything. And I'm also the product of a public education. I know that's a bit under assault right now. <laughs> So I had teachers in my farming community, Rising Sun, Maryland, who believed that women could succeed, that all students had potential. I learned that right from the start. And then I actually applied to come here at UNC to be an undergraduate, but didn't get in <laughs> in 1968, because as I learned later, they had very small quotas of out-of-state women coming in because women had been allowed to come here only three years earlier as first-year students, freshmen. 
And so I always have been very proud that now I'm a full professor here. <laughs> <laughs> that I got here eventually, yes. But then I went, I went to the University of Kentucky where I had not one female professor my entire undergraduate career. I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and there were only two other women in the doctoral program at the time. And I had one female professor who was a nun. <laughs> and, and that's who was teaching in, in, in universities at the time. So we have come a long way in, in, in my lifetime. So that now 60% of undergraduate women, uh, undergraduates here at Carolina are women. Many of my colleagues fabulous colleagues at the School of Journalism are women. We have a female dean, yes, thank you, and a female chancellor. As much as I love you, Holden, this is really a great thing. <laughs> so this is very exciting. The other thing I have to say is that I have also benefited from the counsel, support, and love of many great men in my life. And we had, to, the women who succeeded in my generation needed to have men support us because there weren't enough women to do that at the time. And so Dean, Rich, Dean Jack Adams hired me as a 27 year old right out of graduate school seeing some promise that I didn't even see at that point. And Richard Cole then was a fabulous dean who totally believed in diversity and bringing women onto the faculty. And then my amazing husband, who I think is a better feminist than I'll ever be. <laughs> As Kathy says, he has had me in assisted living for 35 years. <laughs> That's why I want to be her. <laughs> he has supported me every step of the way. And so I want to thank you all for making Carolina one of the very best places in the world to be. It has been such a fabulous career. I can't imagine having been anywhere else. I have such fabulous students. One of them, Amy Liu, now a professor at Northwestern, originally from Beijing, China, studied with me and now a very successful career. And so it, this is a unique, amazing place. And thank you all for all you've done to support Carolina and to support me for so many years. Thank you so much. Now we go to Alan Murray, who worked for Dow Jones for many years, and proof of why he belongs in the Halls of Fame, he's moved on to now a bigger job just recently. But in his honor, Dow Jones is underwriting our dinner tonight. That's called somebody who's got respect. Would Chuck Lovelace, the talented and respected leader of perhaps the biggest brand on this campus besides the J School? No, the Moorhead Kane Scholars. When you said Moorhead Kane in this town, you know what we're talking about, the top, excellence. And like Alan, Chuck came to UNC as a Moorhead Kane Scholar. Come on up, Chuck. It's a Pleasure to introduce Alan tonight, but before I do so, I just wanted to say a word about Don, who was also, Don Bear, who was also a campus media mogul while I was an undergraduate here. Years later, I called on Don to host one of our interns in Washington, D.C., when he was with U.S. News and World Report, and he said, well, I, I think I've got this new startup project for them to work on, and that new startup project was the first college ratings that U.S. News and World Report did. <laughs> Don, it certainly changed American culture, and uh, we all uh, hate you for it, but in any case. <laughs> Alan Murray is an award-winning journalist with almost three decades in, uh, of experience in covering politics and economics, and he also uh, had a stint as a co-host of a public affairs program on CNBC. He served in numerous roles at the Wall Street Journal, including Washington Bureau Chief, but most recently was Deputy Managing Editor and Executive Director online for all of the non-print content, content that the journal produces. Uh, he is the author of three best-selling books and has won two Overseas Press Club Awards for his writings on Asia, as well as a Gerald Lieb Award for his 
coverage of the Federal Reserve. Um, I remember when Allen was named Washington Bureau Chief, I called him to congratulate him and he said, I hope I haven't peaked too early. So <laughs> he obviously didn't. Certainly no one has surfed the tsunami of change in your field uh, with more agility or integrity. And it's a great honor to introduce him tonight. I thought uh, it might be fun to go back and pick up a few of his editorials when he was the Wall Street, uh, excuse me, when he was the Daily Tar Heel editor and report to you on them. They, they, uh, it's interesting, Chancellor, that some of the issues uh, that are in the news today or uh, in front of this campus uh, were the same 35 years ago when Allen was editor. Uh, in one, one particular case was the Honor Court. And in one particular editorial, Allen lambasted student attorney general Chuck Lovelace <laughs> saying, <laughs> saying that the Honor Court was flawed and needed, desperately needed change. <laughs> that was no good, Allen. So. <laughs> Um, another one criticized the segregation in our Greek system. Allen wrote, the fact remains that there are only three blacks in white fraternities, there are no blacks in white sororities, and there are no whites in black fraternities or sororities. Finger pointing doesn't address the, uh, the situation, it merely avoids it. And I'm sad to report, Allen, that that's still the case today, that we have segregated uh, Greek systems. But the final editorial I wanted to uh, read to you because it obviously avoided the selection committee for tonight. And it's called The Deceptive Profession. Journalism schools are in vogue. In 1967, according to Change Magazine, only 24,000 students were enrolled in journalism education programs. Last year, that number had risen to 64,000. At this university, the number of journalism majors has tripled in only 10 years to approximately 300. I'm going to skip the body, but Alan concludes by saying, journalism schools were started across the country several decades ago on a belief that journalism is, like medicine and law, a profession, uh, a, a profession. but learning to write well is not like memorizing laws or parts of the body. It is a skill that cannot be easily taught in a classroom, if at all. The new journalism school vogue is undoubtedly attracting people who have little writing talent and perhaps even little interest in writing. As more of these leave school with their BA degree in journalism, editors may turn to even more non-journalism graduates who have an interest in writing and an education in some other field. He concludes by saying, whatever the implications of this trend, three things are clear. Number one, a journalism degree does not guarantee a good job in journalism. <laughs> Two, the lack of such degree does not uh, necessarily prevent one from getting a good job in journalism. And three, with or without a degree, the freshly graduated journalist is unlikely to find a job as glamorous as uh, Robert Redford's. So. <laughs> All three hold true today, Alan. We are taken back. <laughs> <laughs> Come forward for this well-deserved honor. Thank you. If, if I had realized Chuck was going to do research, I would have asked somebody else to introduce me. Uh, uh, but thank you, uh, thank you, Chuck. Um, uh, thank you, Susan. It's really, uh, it's really great to be here. Oh, and thank you, Dow Jones, for buying me this award. I really appreciate it. Uh, it, it, it. It's great to be here with such a distinguished group. I mean, what a, what a wonderful group of inductees. Uh, Chris, Stacy, uh, Jason, Don, Doug, Wyndham, who have I forgotten, Dwayne, and Jane, uh, and two more to come. It's a real honor to be part of that group. It's an honor to be part of the people who have who have been inducted uh, in the past. These are tough times for journalists. Uh, I don't have to tell you that. The State of the News Media report that uh, my new organization, the Pew Research Center, puts out every year uh, and came out just about a month ago uh, said that uh, newsrooms, staffing in newsrooms is down more than 30% from its peak and is at about the level it was when I graduated from the University of North Carolina, which was a long time ago. It wasn't as long ago as when Don graduated from the University of North Carolina, by the way, just for the record. I want to make that clear. 
but 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 I'd like to use my my uh, two minutes tonight uh, to make two points. Uh, one is I, I've had a lot of fun in my career. I've gotten to do a lot of interesting, different things. Um, I got to run the Washington Bureau of the Journal. I had my own uh, cable news show. I've never had more fun than I've had for the last five years uh, overseeing the digital news operations of Dow Jones. Because uh, first of all, we have more reach than we have ever had before. We were reaching uh, 50 million people a month, order of magnitude greater than at the height of the print paper. We have more tools to interact with people uh, in terms of, of, of uh, blogs, conversations, uh, smart, interactive uh, uh, data, graphics, uh, video. I, I spent a fair amount of my time training reporters uh, in, in taking and filing simple uh, video from their iPhones. Uh, we have probably, f we had 400 people out in the field who were doing that on a regular basis all over, all over the world. So, so it is more fun than it's ever been before. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's one point. And the, and the second point I want to make, and this gets to Chuck's very embarrassing introduction, uh, journalism schools are more important than they have ever been before. And I really mean this. Um, because there is a huge premium on the skills uh, that we need to navigate this new world that those of us who come from, from uh, earlier generations simply don't have. And so having the ability to shoot video, having the ability to build complicated data graphics, having some understanding of computer code, maybe even writing a little code. I hope you're teaching some of that in your yeah. schools. Way to go, Susan. Uh, having the ability to shoot and edit videos. There actually are a lot of skills that those of us uh, who are in hiring jobs in journalism desperately, desperately need. So we really do need journalism schools. Uh, I, I may have felt that way a long time ago, but I think we need journalism schools more than ever right now. Uh, and I would encourage you, Susan, I think it's great that, uh, that the university has Susan, I would uh, encourage you to keep it up. And the one thing I'm absolutely certain of is that whatever the future of journalism, there will be a bunch of UNC graduates who are shaping it. So thank you very much. When I first met the Boone Oakley machine in Charlotte and their amazingly cool advertising headquarters, our new or next awardee was the kind of creative that you could really bank on. To prove it, who did he choose to give his award tonight? His own brother, Michael Johnson, a systems engineer at VeriSign. Where are you? Come on up. You got to do the honors now for our Greg. Good evening, everyone. All right. Well, I'm Michael Johnson, and it's an honor tonight to be part of my brother Greg Johnson's Next Generation Leadership Award. He has more than 20 years of experience in advertising, marketing communication, brand management, and brand development. His expertise and proven track record has helped build some of the most successful and identifiable brands in the world. Greg began his career at J. Walter Thompson as a media planner in New York. He also worked at Saatchi & Saatchi on the Procter & Gamble account on Tide, as well as new product development. Later, Greg moved out west, where he worked as marketing director and founding team member of the Jordan brand, which is a subsidiary of Nike. While marketing director for the Jordan brand, he helped, cre he helped create a marketing platform to transition Michael Jordan and his shoe, the Air Jordan, into one of the most po powerful sport brands. Under Greg's leadership, the brand grew from approximately 100 million to 600 million dollars globally. Greg spent several years out of corporate America and worked on the pastoral staff at the Mount Olivet Baptist Church in Portland, Oregon. Greg is currently the president of Boone Oakley Advertising in Charlotte, where he oversees operations, account services, business development, and strategic planning. They have led campaigns for a number of well-known companies such as HBO, MTV, State Farm Insurance, and CarMax, and last spring, they were a contestant on AMC's reality show, The Pitch. In Charlotte, they've led campaigns for the Mint Museum and the Charlotte Bobcats. Currently, he's very active as part of the leadership team at Grace Covenant Church in Cornelius, North Carolina. Greg earned an MA in theology from the Western Seminary in 2006 and a BA in journalism and mass communication from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1990. He's the second of four children born to Harry and Mary Johnson, he is married to Carol Hedgepath Johnson, also UNC alum. 
The couple has four children. They were born in this order. Benjamin, twin girls, Micah and Mia, and the baby, whose name is spelled like Carolina, but it's pronounced Carolina. Please welcome my brother, my friend, Greg Johnson. Uh, thank you so much, <clears throat> Mike, for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I thought it was appropriate for Mike to uh, introduce me because uh, he was the one who actually brought me to UNC uh, initially. I had always been a fan of Carolina from my early years, but he was, a, he was attending North Carolina Central University, and I had gone to visit him, and he said, I've got to show you something. And he brought me over here to Carolina one night, and by the end of the evening, I was like, wow. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what we did. <laughs> Just know that it was a wow. <laughs> but not only that, um, he's an outstanding uh, role model. Ever since I was a little boy, I w always wanted to be like him. And he's a, a great man, husband, father, and a dear friend. So thank you so much, Mike, for that introduction. Um, I thank God for just this, uh, this honor, for the talents he's given me. Um, there's no way that I could do what I've done separate and apart from his strength. And uh, I, I really, really do thank the journalism school. Uh, Dean King, uh, thank you so much. And the rest of the team for nominating me and giving me this great honor. Um, it means quite a bit to me. I never thought that I'd be getting awards for, what, for something that I enjoy so much uh, through the year. Um, it's been this incredible adventure uh, doing all the things that I've done. I would have never thought um, that I would get to experience the things that I've experienced. Um, I thought that um, you just kind of go to work and you enjoy it and you get a paycheck and, and that was kind of it. So this is a tremendous honor for me. Um, I want to pay special tribute to the person who first introduced me to advertising, uh, Professor John Sweeney. Uh, Uh, he's, he is truly a saint. Um, I, I recently found uh, the first ad that I did in his class, and I, I saw he gave me a C on it. And then I looked at the ad, and I looked at the ad, and I said, oh my god, he gave me a C for this? <laughs> so he's a saint, that John Sweeney. <laughs> um, no, he, John Sweeney has been a, a friend and a mentor and someone who has uh, stayed in touch with me for the past 20 plus years, and uh, he's always an ear for me. He would always call to see how I was doing. Uh, he would always follow up with me to, to invite me to the school, to speak, to mentor, um, and has just been an incredible influence in my life. And I just thank, so, thank him so much uh, for that, um, and I'm honored to know him. Uh, there are so many people that have been a part of my success. I brought the, the quadrant over here in the left. <laughs> Our, our, our friends and family that have uh, supported me throughout um, my career, uncles, brothers, aunts, uh, friends, coworkers, uh, thank you so much for your support. Um, I give a special uh, recognition to my parents, Harry and Mary Johnson, they're sitting over there as well. Um, they're, they're the real saints and the real heroes. Um, in all of this because they put up with me for uh, 40 some years. Um, but they have um, a, a spirit of, of tenacity and fight in them that they've passed on to myself and to my brother, my two brothers and my sister. And even though they didn't have the opportunities that we had, uh, my mother didn't initially finish high school. She has since gone back to do that. And she's been in college, been enrolled in college for a while now. My father has um, done a lot of amazing things as well. But they didn't have the opportunities that we have. But um, we are so thankful for them because they produce four children now with seven degrees, um, with incredible careers, and a lot of uh, children, grandchildren. So when I got my degree from Carolina, I gave it to them because I felt like they earned it just as much as I did um, because of the, for how the support that they've given me um, through that time. 
And then uh, lastly, the person I want to really single out is my wife, uh, Carol Hedgepeth Johnson. Um, she too is an alum of the J School, as Mike had mentioned, um, but she's also had a distinguished career. Uh, she left the, the J School and went to work for Condé Nast Publishing, where she worked for Vanity Fair and Self Magazine. And then she went on to work in Nike, Nike as well in marketing. And then the world-renowned design firm, Sandstrom Design in Portland. And then she went to take on the most important job that any person could take, I think, on the planet. Uh, she gave all of that up to raise our four children. And so for that, I'm eternally grateful for her and uh, for the great work that she has done. So please, can we give her a, a round of applause? <laughs> So someone asked me the other day, um, some of you may know, a few of you know that I'm a preacher, so I'm gonna be up here for about 30 minutes, so just settle, <laughs> just settle in. Bring some more coffee. Someone asked me the other day, why did I, in the middle of my career, leave all of this success that I was having and go to work for a church? And I said, well, it was in part because of the deep faith that I had and, and um, just the belief that I believe the church is the hope of the world. But it was also about this deep conviction that I felt like, given all that had been given to me, I felt a deep sense of responsibility that was really my call in life to give back, and that God had really given me all of this to really be a bridge to someone else, just like so many that I've already named have been a bridge for me. And so I um, told them, this young man that I work with, that I would encourage him to do the same thing, that even though he could, you could make a lot of money, you can do a lot of great things, you can get a lot of awards, but just know that the things that you have been given are in fact um, given to you to be a gift to other people. Uh, in journalism and public relations and advertising, we have been given a great power to persuade, to create, to move and to compel. And all of these are incredible gifts that we have to give away. And we can use our powers for good or for evil. And I, I, I know that because of the institution that we're all a part of and the people, the integrity of the people that we're associated with, that power has been used for good. Um, but in closing, I just want to say this to the leaders, to Chancellor Thorpe and to Dean King and to uh, my friend Dr. Clayton, who I invited here, who is the uh, Vice Provost of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs. I just want to say to you, um, and encourage you to remain steadfast in what you're doing, your resolve to educate, to transform, to compel, and to persuade. Um, I'm one of those reasons that you must stay steadfast. I would have never thought that a little black boy from a small town in North Carolina could achieve the highest levels in his profession, um, and, and then to be receiving an award such as this today. Um, and it is because of the work that you do here at this school, this institution, and it is a very important work. It is a transformative work that propel, propels people and helps put them on a trajectory of success. And for that, I applaud you and I salute you. Um, my final statement is really to uh, David and Clara Oakley, who have given me the chance now to uh, really to, to run their, their, this company that they have built over the course of the past 12 years. And that is a great honor that they have given me and uh, one that I hold dearly. Um, and David and Clara, we're going to do some amazing things. So we'll probably be back here. They'll probably want us to come back next year to read some of uh, some other award, um, I'm sure. Well, thank you all so much. This is a great honor. I really appreciate it. At this time of dislocation, the media business, you know, a lot of parents are worrying, hmm, what, am I, what kind of job is my uh, student going to get? Career services, more and more important in every place in higher education and really important here at uh, the journalism school. And I think there is no better tribute to our commitment to our students' future than the fact that our next awardee, a 99 grad, chose to have the person who heads up our career services um, section of the school give him his award. That says something about that role in his life. So Jay Eubank, Director of Career Services, would you come and give our last award for the night? I have one of the best jobs in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. I get to work with students to help them land internships, craft their first resume, and hopefully get a first job. It's a job that's rewarding and challenging, and oftentimes, you never quite know how the story is going to end. With that in mind, let me tell you a true story about my job and the type of students the School of Journalism and Mass Communication produces. And it's a story that produces an outstanding alum 
one who has the ear of one of the most powerful politicians in the world, Speaker of the U.S. House, John Boehner. The J School participates in the Washington Center for Politics and Journalism program, which provides a select group of students with the opportunity to work full time at a Washington uh, DC newspaper or news organization. It's a great program. It's uh, been around since 1988 and has helped launch the careers of many in journalism and politics and public relations since its inception. At the time, uh, the J School could nominate one student per semester. So that fell to me to kind of orchestrate that process. In 1999, we had already decided on our nominee when a student came by to see me about being nominated. He had done well in an internship at the Herald Sun in Durham and had high marks from his editors there and was eager to gain experience in Washington, D.C. Thus, a dilemma. We already had our nominee, who I had to go back and double check, but was, is Holly Tusi, who is now one of the top Middle Eastern correspondents for the Associated Press, equally a, a very talented journalist. But, but a hard part of being a career counselor in the J School is to tell a talented student no, and one that I try to avoid at all costs. So I decided we would try to bend the rules a bit. I decided to roll the dice and submit two nominees, Holly Tusi and Michael Steele. The worst that likely could happen, I thought, would be that for one of them to be turned down. So in September 1999, after graduating from UNC, Michael Steele began a fast rising career as a journalist and communications pro in Washington, DC. Michael excelled as the Washington Bureau intern for the Detroit News. Similarly, Holly ended up doing a great job for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. It turns out it really wasn't a roll of the dice. And I'm not surprised whatsoever that it's turned out the way it's turned out. After the internship with the Detroit News, Michael joined the National Review online and then the National Journal as a reporter. But like so many, Michael saw the opportunity on the Hill. Not Chapel Hill, Capitol Hill. He became a press secretary, first in 2003, for U.S. Representative John Shattig of Arizona, and then for U.S. Representative Jim McCreary of Louisiana. Next, he was communications director for the House Ways and Means Committee. He worked in Governor Mitt Romney's 2008 primary campaign before joining John Boehner's office in February 2008. Timing is everything, and Michael play, has played a key role in one of the main initiatives that's led to the uh, Republicans taking over the House of Representatives in 2010 midterm elections. He was an integral part in shaping the GOP's pledge to America. He has stayed close to Boehner, and as any good press secretary no does, he knows his boss and how to pitch the Speaker's agenda. On a day-to-day -day basis, Michael helped shape the House GOP message, serving as a key point person for both the Capitol Hill and National Press Corps. He's recognized throughout Washington, D.C. for that work. The National Journal included Michael Steele as one of its 35 and under power set for being one of Washington's next generation power players. The influ influential online site BuzzFeed went as far as to say he is one of the people running Washington. His ability to take tough questions and stand in the line of fire, so to speak, was recognized by Mitt Romney's 2012 campaign. Michael took a leave of absence from Speaker Boehner's office to become vice presidential nominee Paul Ryan's traveling press secretary. Michael would tell you it was an interesting experience, one that in today's hyperspeed media world means that you have to be firm, fair, and sometimes not so well liked by the press. But every successful press secretary knows that he or she will take some arrows along the way. But Michael survived and is still one of the Hill's most influential communicators. Along the way, Michael made sure, I'm sure he will tell you, one of his best communications efforts in marrying Mary Catherine, who is a vice president with FTI Consulting. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to turn it over to a most deserving Next Generation Leadership Award winner, Michael Steele. One of our favorite graduates and a member of this Hall of Fame once asked, what is it that binds us to this place as to no other? 
as the Chancellor and Mr. Baer touched on, I think the answer lies in our state and the character of our people. Will Blythe and others have written that what separates us, separates us from the school up the road is our rootedness in a particular place, the state of North Carolina. For years, my father has told me that the three most admired men in our state are Billy Graham, Andy Griffith, and Dean Smith. <laughs> he always said it showed North Carolinians have a sense of uh, priorities, God, humor, and basketball. <laughs> but something else binds those three great men, decency. It is the defining virtue of our state, this veil of humility between two mountains of conceit. A state where the governor and the auto mechanic both wear khakis to church and share a devotion to soft-spokenness and hard work. And so, because this is, as it was meant to be, a university of the people, we all take that North Carolina decency wherever we go. Having worked for the past dozen or so years in Washington in politics and journalism, I have to say that decency is what is too often lacking in our public debates. Each partisan can cite chapter and verse of how the other side started it. Each journalist can tell you about the relentless pressure to tweet, to live blog, to go chatter on cable just because the other guys are. There's always an excuse to embrace a new low. And for too many people have come to believe that decency itself is a roadblock to success in a dog-eat-dog -dog bottom line world. But we know that's not true. Here on this campus, we have all watched our Tar Heels perform at the highest level for decades with a winning combination of grit and grace. And that's the lesson we take from Carolina. Decency is not a sign of weakness. It is the heart of true greatness. In closing, I'd like to thank the people who taught me those lessons. Jay Eubank, who bent the rules to send an indifferent student with a passion for politics to Washington, D.C. Professors like Jim Shoemaker and Chuck Stone. Other folks who are here tonight, Chris Heaney and Raj Premakumar, both lifelong friends and Carolina men. My father, Charles Steele, and his wife, Molly particularly my mother, June, a UNC employee for 25 years who earned a MBA at Keenan Flagler at nights and weekends. And of course, my wife, Mary Catherine. Her parents drove here from Mississippi to be here tonight. She's not a fan of any sport whatsoever. <laughs> and she recently suffered through her first game at the Dean Dome <laughs> because it made me very happy. <laughs> Thank you all for this honor. I will endeavor to be worthy of it and of the example set by the extraordinary group of inductees this evening. Thank you and good night. Michael said it best, an extraordinary group, and I think it's been an extraordinary night, and I thank you all. You've been a fantastic audience. A couple of thank yous, Kyle, Megan, uh, Rachel and Morgan, all of whom did incredible work to make this come through tonight. I really want to thank them. And, and to the committee who chose them, there was a committee, Joyce Fitzpatrick, our alum, and Ken Udy, um, Farrell Gillis, um, John Sweeney, and Speed Hallman. Thank you for such an extraordinary group. And I guess we just got to leave with the motto, Don, of North Carolina. It's that kind of night. To be rather than to seem. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>